I'm going to introduce, introduce our final speaker for today, um, Dr. Paul Horn, and I would like to tell you that this man is incredible, and you're, you're very lucky to have him, and I'm not going to even bother to read his bio because it would take the 45 minutes, so we've allotted for him. So I asked him what did he want me to say about him and convey to you, and what he told me was that he is the only senior executive at IBM, male or female, that sports a ponytail. Okay. So Dr. Paul M. Horn is the Senior Vice Pro Provost for Research and Senior Vice Dean for Strategic Initiatives and Entrepreneurship at the Tandon School of Engineering at NYU. He is responsible for providing university-wide leadership in advancing research, coordinating research among various schools of the university, and shaping the strategic planning for the university's research enterprise. I encourage you to download the rest of the information about this fine gentleman, and I cede the platform to you. Well, good afternoon. We've had a, a long day looking, listening to scenarios of the future, and I'm going to try to keep it lively and scare you a little bit, because I think much of our focus on the future has been extrapolations, linear extrapolations from where we are today, and the world isn't changing linearly, it's changing exponentially. And you can't um, understand that without understanding how information technology and information is changing. It's changing at a rate which is mind-boggling. And in fact, it's not just changing information, it's the ch changing everything in the world we live in. So for the older gray hairs in the audience, they might remember this. This is a room full of uh, computers in the uh, circa 1955. And just to give you a scale of the change in technology since that time, this thing is 10 million times slower than your iPhone. 10 million, seven orders of magnitude. Uh, so the changes in just a few years have been staggering. Probably the best way to understand them and to think about them was generated by Ray Kurzweil and Moravec, who did this terrific plot of the amount of computation you could buy for $1,000 um, versus year, plotted it on a semi-log plot, so a straight line on this would be exponential growth. And you can see it's growing much more rapidly than exponential, it's curved upward. So a straight line through the red dots uh, technologists would call that Moore's law. That's a, the, basically the law that we can put more in an integrated circuit every year and get more and more power out of it. Um, and as you can see, the amount of change is enormous. So this was published in 1999, and so you might first want to ask, well, where are we today? That was still, you know, that's quite a number of years ago. So let's just take a look. I, I, I looked at what I could buy from Amazon, um, a um, Intel microprocessor for about $1,000. Today there's eight cores on the little chip. They're, uh, it's hyper-threaded, so you can do 16 different channels of operation in each core at the same time. And they run at around three and a half to four gigahertz. So you just multiply that out, and I won't go into the details, and let's uh, uh, believe that there's enough cash so everything operates smoothly, and you run into a point which is basically 500 billion operations a second, which you can buy for $1,000. That's, that's pretty impressive. And as you can see, this is through multiple different layers of tech, uh, types of technology, actually, Going back, I particularly like this because this was uh, uh, these were mechanical computers by a guy by the name of Hollerith in the, the old days. Um, so that's pretty impressive, but how fast is 500 billion operations a second? Is that you know going to change the world? Well, one way to do it is let's compare it to something and let's compare it to the operational power of your brain. And this is pretty simple. The brain has got about 100 billion neurons. It's got a lot of neurons. 
uh, they each one can fire at about a couple hundred times a second. So they, they have a cycle time of a few milliseconds. And they're, each one is connected to about a thousand other ones. So you do the same thing I did for the microprocessor. You assume they're all going to be used. You assume you're optimizing uh, everything that you've got in those connections. And then what you get is something about 20 times 10 to the 15th, 20 petaflops, 20 million billion operations a second. So we're actually, uh, the iPhone for a thousand bucks is still pretty slow compared to uh, this thing. But this is not so slow. It's about four orders of magnitude, about 10,000 times dumber than your brain. And you all know that when you interact with Siri and your iPhone. <laughs> um, so let's, uh, oh, let me, just as an aside, you could also want to, you might also want to ask how much memory there is. And in your brain, there's sort of about 100 terabytes, which is not that much, actually. So it's the same argument with your computer. So a lot of people think, and there are estimates that we only use about 1% of this, 1% or 2% of the brain. And for many operations that you're going to use that big, fancy microprocessor for, you're not really using it either. You're maybe using a couple percent of it. So it's not a bad comparison. And remember, all of these things are just pie in the sky, um, rough order of magnitude estimates. But they're sort of give you a feeling for ballparks. So that gives us a human brain line on that curve. It's up there in the top right. Um, that's about what you need to get to. Now, if you look at it this way, that 10 orders, uh, that four orders of magnitude, that factor of 10,000, doesn't look so big, does it? Um, in fact, if you want to just sort of guess when do we get there, and again, all of this is a little flaky, but it's not crazy. And the just straight line that I drew gets you there around 2034. Now, people are going to argue, well, you don't think uh, the, uh, you don't program a computer the way it doesn't learn the way you learn. It's different. And, you know, just because it's got the same manip, MIPS, same actual uh, power, it's not the same as a human. Uh, let me tell you, we're going to hit that line, and we're going to start programming computers in ways and have already in ways that are very similar to the way we learn now. So we are going to expect, you should be expecting massive, very significant changes. Um, in fact, um, if you, there was a conference about 10 years ago and uh, on uh, basically the existential threat of AI, which somebody mentioned uh, because Elon Musk is it's one of his worries. Um, uh, the, in that uh, conference, they estimated when that crossing point, which has become known as the singularity, would happen. And the average estimate was 2040. So if anything, we're on that more or less on that path, maybe a few years earlier, maybe a few years later, maybe it'll be $10,000 instead of $1,000. But we're, we're going to be up there. Now, why do they call that? Why, why is that point so scary? And why do they call it the singularity? Well, singularity is it's sort of a hypothetical idea that when uh, compute power gets as uh, um, equal to what human brain can do, and let's imagine in that hypothetical future, the human, uh, the computer could do all the intellectual activities of a human. And I mean all, not just beat the, beat the human in chess. I mean all the intellectual activities. Well, if we could really do all the intellectual activities, one of the intellectual activities that humans do is they make computers. So a smarter than human computer 
could make, or a robot, or whatever you want to call it, could make even smarter machines. And you would have then, when you cross that point, an intelligence explosion. And since it would be basically impossible for an unaided human to figure out what a much smarter computer would be like and would do, that point, that transition point is called the singularity and is viewed as being an event horizon sort of beyond which you can't really guess what's going to happen. So we're, we are coming to a point in, in maybe 15, 20 years where we are going to have machines as smart as we are, and it's very hard to, to estimate what's going to happen beyond that. Now, of course, that opens up because you can't be scientific about it. It opens up science fiction. And you've all seen the movies, the Terminators or the uh, Matrix or whichever one, the smarter uh, than human machines then try to uh, annihilate what's left of the human, um, uh, uh, the human population or, um, or perhaps uh, humans merge with uh, and become cyborgs and their minds all come together in the, in the internet um, all of these uh, uh, scary scenarios. Well, while they may be scary and um, they may be science fiction today, we are rapidly coming into a time when we need to be thinking about, uh, you know, what's really going to happen and how real is all this. So the, all of this is happening because, you know, things are changing so rapidly. Now I'm a technologist not a science fiction writer. Um, so I spent a lot of time looking at these technology trends back when I was running research for IBM. Um, and you can predict them very well. You can't get specifics, uh, but you can really predict and, and follow the trends. And it is absolutely certain that this is going to happen, that, that we're going to cross that point. What does it mean? I, that I can't answer. We spent a lot of time predicting speeds and feeds. And there's no Heisenberg uncertainty principle. There's no need for quantum computing to get there. There's no need for esoteric new inventions. A lot of technology has to happen. More parallelism, more dealing with the power. There's all sorts of things that has to happen. Uh, miniaturization has to continue, not at the rate it's been happening, but still has to continue. Um, and uh, so we're going to get there. So uh, I'm going to tell you a couple of trends. Now the trends themselves are, are going to be completely obvious to you. So I'm not going to tell you whether the machines are taken over, but, but I will tell you about trends. And um, the more, a most interesting thing that I'll have to say, which will not be particularly profound, is that the speed at which these trends are going to happen. So the first is the emergence of the connected human cyborg. Now, this is not science fiction. We are already connected to machines in, in more ways than you can imagine. Of course, there are passive connections like uh, artificial uh, uh, joints or uh, various artificial parts, which are in humans today. Um, uh, but, and those things are becoming smaller and more active. So for example, uh, some of them that you may or may not have seen before, uh, one of them is an embedded RFID chip which is used, um, actually, FDA approved now. It's used by, in a, by a Swedish company. They injected it, they injected it, it's about that big, they inject it here in the back of the hand, and they use it to uh, keep track of people in, uh, in, very, in their uh, employ. They go for safety reasons on uh, construction sites. It's good for a variety of things. It's like having a, t a tag. It's just it's, it's there embedded inside. 
And then there are many more now than ever before active devices like um, like this is one the spinal cord simulator that Medtronic has, which basically measures certain activities and will give you a stimulation in the in various areas in your spinal cord to remove back pain. Or there's um, um, now various forms. There's no real um, bionic eye that looks like that. But there are artificial eyes now connected directly to the, to the um, optic nerve. Uh, they're photo arrays. Um, and they help people that are blind. And they uh, allow them to get some level of vision. It's still very crude, but it's, it's happening. And there are implants in people's brains. Uh, Medtronic does this as well. Uh, they, it's used for uh, people that have epilepsy. It measures um, various neural patterns. And um, when an epileptic fit is about to happen, it gives a stimulation in the right way to prevent that from happening in the brain. It gives a stimulation in the brain. So we're starting to see more active componentry that's connected to us. Um, and there are, now this is mostly experimental, um, but there are now um, brain arrays based, that sit um, under, most of them are under the skin. Uh, you can put them on top of the skull, but they're not quite sensitive enough to do what people would like them to do. Um, and what they like them to do is drive prosthesis. So they like them to be able to uh, be connected, usually by RFID, to a, um, something like a prosthetic arm. If a per someone has lost uh, their uh, hand or arm um, in an accident or in combat, uh, these sorts of devices then can, uh, the brain can learn how to use them. They're trained. And they can actually, in a rudimentary way now, operate a, a remote arm. So we're starting to could be connected to technology in ways that have never happened before. And not only are we connected to technology, but we're becoming part of the Internet of Things. Now, again, this is not something that should surprise anybody. I mean, every, you know, if you assume as you see someone with a telephone in their ear, they're basically connected to the internet. Or a various devices now, and there's a long list of them. Uh, like, let's go directly. To, so there's just some of them that people are connected all around their body, strapped to their wrists, or in one way measuring some bodily function or other, uh, that um, is connected to the internet. Um, I don't know if I should tell a slightly off color joke, but I, or story, but it's a, uh, it's probably, I had a conversation a long time ago with the head doctor at Medtronic. Now, if you're, uh, uh, been around as long as I have, you know that pacemakers, you used to have to change the frequency of them by actually inserting a triangular needle into the chest and turning a potentiometer. And he had a patient, they couldn't understand why, and this is a true story, that kept coming back with infections in the chest. And they could be very dangerous. And they came back multiple times. And they found out, finally, the guy admitted what happened. He lifted one of these triangular needles. And every time he wanted to make love with his wife, he turned himself up. <laughs> now, this can, now this is all done on the internet. <laughs> So um, we are connected in ways that you just, you know, might not imagine. So what can you say about this trend? Well, the trend, absolutely, the early applications, which are there now, are going to be restorative and corrective. Um, they're coming and they exist. Uh, they will be things like continuous monitoring for health and wellness, 
Uh, you can imagine, by, by the way, all of these things have obvious battlefield and military applications. Um, um, so continuous monitoring for health and wellness. Uh, you're going to see in social and in, in, in the general uh, public, these applications are everywhere. They're going to come in spite of any privacy issues. There aren't going to be any real regulatory roadblocks for more and more of this to happen, at least in the early stages. Um, uh, you're going to start to see these brain sensing arrays. Again, an early, early use will be restorative and corrective. Uh, but you, they're right now, they're basically in the research phase, but within five to ten years, they're going to be more readily available for, for patients who have lost limbs. Um, then um, you're actually going to start to see brain augmentation. That's, again, not so crazy if you think of connecting to the Internet with your, um, with your ear, um, uh, there are various things, and they will initially be done for uh, people that have problems of one form or another. Uh, they'll be corrective, but uh, they will augment how your brain functions. And then I'm guessing now, completely guessing, but within 30 years I could imagine this could be even widespread. And here, obviously, there are all sorts of ethical and moral issues when you have the ability to enhance people um, um, for a, some amount of money. So this is the first trend. It's really, it's happening. It's going to continue to happen. And um, there are obvious uh, a, and applications and scenarios that would be important for the military. This is not an area I know a lot about but I certainly can guess that this has battlefield applications, knowing where your soldiers are, uh, knowing where the, and um, giving the warfighter enhanced vision or other uh, physical attributes uh, could clearly be important. Okay, trend two. The second trend is, I'm calling it machine intelligence. And the first thing you need to know is that machines are going to stop being programmed. Robots are going to not. Well, sure, yes, they'll still be programmed. But they're going to learn. They're going to learn not quite the way we do initially. They're going to learn by reading. So you'll remember the Jeopardy challenge, which was the um, um, a sort of a step on the path to the Turing test. So what's the Turing test? The Turing test was a test that Alan Turing uh, came up with when he said, when someone asked him, how do I know when a computer has true human intelligence? And being a very practical person, he said, hmm. Well, how do, I don't know how to define human intelligence. So let's have a very simple test. I'll put a computer behind a screen and a human behind a screen, and I'll be able to ask that computer or human uh, questions, and I'll give me an arbitrarily long amount of time to ask, and don't make me go away after a minute or two. And if I can't tell, if the thing behind the screen is a human or computer, it must have human intelligence. So it's a, the Jeopardy is a step toward human intelligence, uh, uh, Turing test, measuring for. And the way the Watson team won that, and I was started this project just before I left IBM, and when I started it, they, it couldn't beat a five-year-old. Um, the way it actually won the competition was they had the computer reading. They trained it by just having it read. It read uh, newspapers, it read uh, encyclopedias, it read all sorts of things, and it was able to infer correlations that ultimately allowed it to answer questions. Machine learning now has become everywhere. 
It's the way that if you have um, vision, uh, a visual uh, problem, uh, computer vision, you want to find a tank in the trees, uh, the best way today for programming natural language understanding or machine vision or any of those are all done by various forms of deep computer learning. Uh, and that's sort of the way we learn as people. The reason why this is so hard is you have in your head about 10 million sort of random facts. A classic example would be uh, you know two planes can't land or take off on a run with the same runway at the same time. Well, you could, how could you guess what 10 million of those things to put into and, and program into a computer? You could never do that. So without the ability to do that, you really have to have the computers learn the way you learn. Um, and that's now happening. Initially by reading, more by uh, soon, more by seeing, and seeing it's used uh, for um, um, uh, visual problems of one form or another, and eventually even by hearing. So what can we say about uh, machine intelligence in that evolution that's going to happen? Well, the first thing we can say is that machines are going to become much more human-like. They're going to learn the way we learn, and they're going to operate and interact with us in ways that is much more human-like. Uh, computer human interfaces, HCIs, will be much more lifelike, and you'll really get some value out of talking with Siri. She's going to be useful and much more human-like. Um, Domain experts, and this is going to be broad, will no longer be humans. They'll be doctors and lawyers will have to do prescription, doctor prescriptions by machines. And the prescriptions will be uh, optimized to your particular genome. By the way, I didn't put it in this chart, but the cost of doing uh, a human genome right now is about $1,000, and in the next few years, it's, the prices are plummeting. Um, I estimated by, tw by uh, two years from now, it'll be down to $100. So it can be, will be part, in fact, some um, hospitals are starting to put the genome in your personal um, um, electronic computer record, uh, health records in your computer. So that program, so machines will have to do all that. Uh, that were computers, they'll have to do all that. Um, clearly, there's going to be a revolution in computer vision and language understanding. Um, you're already starting to see the beginnings of that now. And the, we're going to have to deal with the ability of having autonomous, learned um, uh, objects of all sorts. Uh, making decisions with all their, uh, the complexity and ethical issues that, that that involves. All of this is coming. Okay, one last trend. How am I doing on time? All right. The last trend is, if you, you think the last two were guesses, this last one's even more of a guess, and it's uh, uh, probably different from some of the other talks we've heard today. Um, the last guess is about the evolution of media and com communication. And it relates to um, the emergence, among other things, of uh, virtual reality and augmented reality. And this is already um, a huge market. Goldman Sachs estimates it's going to be $80 billion in, in by 2025. Um, uh, based on, on its growth and a whole bunch of emerging uh, applications. And right now, it's got, um, you see it in entertainment games, training, 
of all sorts, therapy, design, uh, even in pornography. It's, um, it's everywhere. Um, so, what can I say about that? Well, the first thing I want to say is that the interactions that you will have in your virtual environments are going to expand from sight only to touch and even possibly smell. Uh, we've got one project at NYU which is to that's actually being done jointly between our engineering and our and our um, nursing schools, which is a virtual reality cave with with haptic interfaces. So you can actually feel things and touch things, um, and the impact of, uh, of that when you're doing various procedures, for example, or you're treating patients. Um, so you're already starting to see things like um, uh, touch become part of the virtual environments and, and possibly even smell. Um, communities uh, that were traditionally formed for uh, safety um, uh, and nation states um, uh, basically, um, you, you know, you don't need them. They're uh, be going to be destabilized. They're becoming virtual. And this is all driven much faster by social media trends. So social media trends tend uh, to polarize rather than, than homogenize populations. And some good examples of that are in studies of the political uh, blogosphere here in the US, we all know that our politics is far more polarized than it ever has been. And if you look at blogs, uh, they all stay within their own same social media. Or if you look at tweets, which is the bottom. So if you're um, left leaning or right leaning, you tend to tweet and blog and talk with people within your own echo chamber. You don't tend to talk with people in there in, in uh, other echo chambers. And there is a, a terrific new book uh, called Connectography by um, Kana, which talks about how this uh, whole technology destabilizes um, uh, the um, borders and transcends all sort of geopolitical boundaries. And, um, you know, you're starting to see the homogenation effect that exists in, um, in places like the EU break down. Um, and part of that breakdown can be traced to the fact that the new local regions can build up their own um, intellectual ethos uh, within their own um, uh, communities. Uh, so I would like to think that the secular center, which has been so important for the uh, growth of civilization, is actually going to have a, be to some degree threatened and possibly destabilized by social media technology. And of course, like everything I've said, the political implications are uh, to quote one of our presidential candidates, huge. <laughs> so, one final thought. What I've been talking about is really the evolution of the human species. I've been talking about how technology is going to be more and more a, a part of our future, whether we merge with it or whether um, some other thing a machine transcends human beings. And if you look at our evolution, um, whether you believe or not in, in traditional biological evolution, um, or you believe in, in intelligent design, if you think about where we are and where we're going to be in the future, we, the collective society that we're all in, we are the blind architects of our own future. We are the intelligent designers. We are changing the future of what human beings will be 
20, 30, 50, 100 years from now. For better or worse, we are the architects. And um, given what you read in the paper every day, the fact that we're architecting our future could be pretty damn scary. <laughs> so that's, uh, that's it. Now, before I get off the stage, uh, I absolutely want to do one bit of advertisement. Um, we have a terrific event coming on uh, where we're hack hacking um, um, uh, humanitarian and um, disaster relief in dense urban populations. Uh, it's going to be uh, in early October at, uh, in Brooklyn. Uh, it's brought to you by um, NYU and our partnership, uh, our partner, which is the Partnership for New York, and our sponsors. Uh, I want to particularly um, thank um, uh, Colonel Mahaney, for, uh, the, who's been pushing us to, to focus on this. It's a terrific area in the Strategic Studies Group, and by this relatively new thing called MD5, the National Security Technology Accelerator, which um, and NYU is very much involved with, which is aimed at um, getting ideas and technologies out of the Raiders of the Lost Ark warehouse, uh, which is where a lot of early um, Department of Defense research ends up, and commercializing it in the civilian marketplace. That's it. Thank you very much. Sir, Colonel McLaughlin from the Chief of Staff of the Army Strategic Studies Group. You've done a really good job about outlining what you see as future trends in this realm of information. But one of the things that you really didn't touch on that I'm curious about is how do you see this opens us up, especially as a military, to vulnerabilities from our adversaries? Uh, I'm afraid you asked a question I know very little about, so I can just guess. I mean, one of the things that I think you were, which is part of the um, uh, fact that uh, technology is evolving so fast, and, and there's so much money and force uh, uh, behind it coming from around the world, is that you're going to have to have your military solutions be based on open um, open source and, and, and COTS um, technologies and componentry from around the world. And that means that uh, you're, for, in all of that, you're going to have security um, and um, uh, issues of, of a variety of forms. You need to take technology that's open and put it into an electronic componentry that's open and protect it, make sure there's nothing hidden in it when you get it, maybe from a foundry in China, and protect it when you integrate it at multiple levels into a sophisticated um, uh, system of one form or another. So there's, to me, the biggest threats in all of this is you're going to have to use technology which is broadly sourced, and it's going to be technology that you have to protect from cyber attacks and from hidden cyber in, in intrusions. I'm sure there are many more, but that's the one that comes to the top of my head. Hi, uh, Ricky Smith. Since you were there when, when Watson began and some other, mm -hmm. and you've done this for a couple of decades now, what have been your biggest surprises? Uh, because you're guessing now and we're listening. But if you look backwards, say, two decades, what's been the biggest surprise for you in this world? <sighs> biggest surprise. Well, um, we do pro did grand challenges when I was there at IBM, uh, beating Gary Kasparov at chess, um, uh, building the blue jean supercomputer, things like that. Uh, to, that brought us uh, leadership back to the United States. Uh, we did projects like that uh, to stimulate the technical community. 
probably the biggest surprise for me was the impact it had on um, the company at large, that there really was commercial, um, 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 a commercial, it wasn't done for, um, that we would turn it into a product, uh, that we thought there was going to be a substantial uh, future revenue. It was done to excite the technical community more than anything else. And so if there was a surprise to me is that 10 years later there's a division of IBM called the Watson Group. Um, I, I would have never guessed that. Uh, sir, going back to the question the Colonel asked, uh, you showed a slide that said that this continued uh, increase in information technology threatened communities or s the whole idea of community. Communities were formed because of survival, security, and socialization. I, I, I rapidly, quickly, and totally agree that the socialization could be fully consumed by computers. But what happens to survival and security the more we become machine independent? Does that leave a yawning gap of barbarians at the gate by which we will be virtually, no pun intended, ignorant of or unaware of? Uh, yeah, that's a terrific question, and I don't have a simple answer for it. There was a great uh, op-ed by Kevin Maney from uh, um, um, Business Week uh, that was talking about the de-evolution de of, um, of societies and, and um, countries and how that was uh, going to be the future of the world, and I sent him a note back asking him your question, uh, saying, you know, what's, that's fine, but let's imagine that happens. Um, to a large degree, we've uh, built our countries, uh, nation states have been an important part of our, our sec security, our secure world, and presently fairly secure world. What happens uh, when things break down into tribes? And um, he didn't have a good answer for that question, neither do I. Uh, Dr. Horn, I'd like to, to build off your, your final thought for a moment uh, that you know, we're the, the unwitting architects of, of, of this technology in some respects. Uh, more particularly, I mean, there are computer scientists and entrepreneurs who are developing uh, all of this technology. And, and I'm wondering if you could help unpack the, uh, the incentives that those people will face. If, if science fiction tells us there are, there are dystopian futures out there that, that we could be heading to, or there's these benign futures like, you know, the Star Trek ship's computer, uh, or, or even an older work of science fiction, you know, Frank Herbert's Dune, uh, which was set in a, a universe where computers no longer existed because they had been vanished and done away with in an in a intergalactic jihad. Um, how do the people in your industry, in, in, in respond to, to those ideas and, and the incentives they face? That's a t another tough question. Um, what's driving this now has got nothing to do with ethics or the future of humanity. What's driving this technology is business. There's a huge demand for it. It gives people more le leisure. It gives people more freedom. Um, to do things that they want to do with their time. And that drives the technology, um, and that put, that's why there's so much money behind it, by the, behind the R&D of information technology writ large. So um, I don't think any of those more subtle issues are, are being thought about at all. That's why... Um, you're starting to see conferences like um, uh, worrying about the existential threat of what we're doing because we're really doing this blindly. And, um, and it's very hard to regulate even though there are very substantial ethical issues because there's such a demand uh, for the technology um, for its cost benefits. So um, I don't think there are very many people thinking about what you, the hard question you just asked, and that's scary. 
Okay, is this the last one? Okay. Um, so you talked about perhaps singularity as early as 2032. Is that with binary computing or does quantum computing change that axis? So quantum, so that's with, with traditional binary computing. You won't need quantum computing to get there. Um, um, and I, and I want to, um, I want to emphasize that that point is sort of arbitrary because, you know, because, yeah, I mean, if you take the biggest supercomputers in the world today and that filled up rooms bigger than this, they're about there now. So it's not as if it won't happen. Um, but it, until it becomes this down in your, in, your, in your pants pocket, then it won't have the kind of universal impact. Um, but it's going to happen without quantum computing. Now, will quantum computing change that? Not really, because quantum computing will be used for a very select set of unique problems, like um, breaking encryption. Um, it won't be used broadly. And what's more likely to happen um, that will revolutionize this is the move from traditional processors and graphic processors to neural processors. And um, I suspect that uh, without, in the not too distant future, and there are companies that are moving in this direction, you will have a neural processor doing all the image recognition and speech recognition, voice so you can talk to your computer, in your uh, iPhone in the not too distant future. We made them in the industry 20 years ago. We, made, we constructed special purpose neural processors, but they were too hard to program. And traditional processes were getting better faster and faster, so uh, they just kept going, improving faster and faster than the neural processors could. Even though at any given point in time, the neural processor was maybe a factor of 100 to 1,000 faster. So if we have now with deep learning, it's much easier to program them, um, then I suspect that's much more likely to be uh, a technology uh, accelerator than quantum computing. Uh, yes, doctor, you mentioned that uh, domain experts said doctors and lawyers would eventually become machines. Some people would think that we've already achieved that. But to your last uh, point, when do you see uh, us then using computers and doing the reverse of what you talked about, programming the human brain and optimizing the human brain to take advantage so we stay ahead of the computers? Um, I, I, I'm not, I, don't, I don't see us um, programming the human brain. What I do think of it more likely to be is an augmentation of the human brain. Um, so. Um, a neural processing chip, which might, might be embedded in 30, 40 years, uh, will give you many of the, um, of the intellectual powers of a computer by itself. I, I just want to stress one more thing. Um, uh, I'm not talking about biological evolution. I'm talking about natural selection. So it's within an existing gene pool. So more uh, traditional evolution, the gene pool changes. Um, so um, you need to think about dogs. Um, a, a chihuahua can mate with a Great Dane. Um, it might not be a good idea, but biologically, they could, they could, they could mate. Um, you will be able to mate with some few, future cyborg. Whether it's a good idea or not, I don't know. But uh, what I'm talking about is not, not a change in the, um, uh, in the biology of some future uh, being, but more a change in the character uh, within the existing human gene pool. 
Uh, Dr. Horn, from our uh, online community, can you discuss how will the advent of technology spoke about impact the relationship between leader and follower or supervisor and employee? Oh, boy. <laughs> um, I think a lot of this is uh, will enable uh, more, and you see that already in open source sof software development and elsewhere. It op it it um, enables more community. Um, uh, management of pro collective management and community management of projects. Um, that you see that more in, in modern, very innovative companies. Um, does that get rid of uh, command and control completely? Uh, I don't think so. Uh, there still will still be plenty of, uh, of scenarios where a more traditional command and control organization will be required and will um, um, be the only way certain things get accomplished. But I do think that the kinds of technology I'm talking about does enable more uh, community development and community uh, control. Thank you. Thank you. So, sir, sir, in the Spirit of the Mad Scientist Initiative, thank you very much for the presentation. It was sobering, borderline scary at points, but also very <laughs> promising. And I would highlight the hackathon uh, that uh, Dr. Horn was talking about. It's collaboration. That's what it really a hackathon is about. And your spirit and willingness to share with us, we very much appreciate it. There's thank the you, highly very coveted very coin, sir. You. <laughs> and your declaration as an official mad scientist, although I think Watson probably saw that one coming. <laughs> and then finally, sir, your mood ring cup. Thank, thank you very you. much, sir. Thank sure. you, Pat.